Hi, welcome to the Business Markers webinar. Welcome to our virtual studio here, hosted by AB Sound in Opwijk in Belgium. We're looking forward to another 45 minutes uh, together uh, on this webinar, on this topic, making you grow with zero marketing budget. My name is Christoph Sintubin. I'm one of the co-founders of the company of Business Markers, and I have the pleasure of introducing our two keynotes for today, and as well taking the time to share some practicalities with you. Let's start with those. First of all, this is normally the screen that you're looking at. And what you can see is that you have on the right-hand side a tab called questions where you can ask questions or share comments. And you will only be able to see your question. That's for privacy reasons. But if you have anything to share, just share it in this in this tab. And we will, at the, in the studio, see what the result is and try to respond to that. We have a Q&A section at the end of this session where we will definitely talk about your question. Next to that, you can see a polls question, and there are several polls in this presentation, and there you can take your vote uh, whenever this poll becomes active, so you will be informed. So this is the way that things are working. Now I'm going to spend just a few more moments on our company, on business markers. We are an atypical kind of consultancy uh, company, not just for the part of being, being different, but because we have all people in our team that have been in your seat in a certain way. We have over 20 years of experience each and either have been active as director, as VP or as C-level and then decided to share our experiences together with other, other entrepreneurs and managers. And this is exactly what Business Market stands for. And we do this for a lot of companies, over 150 active companies today, uh, of which you can see a few here on screen. We cover the four pillars of entrepreneurship. We start with strategy, talk about people, and we focus on, on how to bring your people in, customers and operational excellence all the way to the process. In these COVID times, we decided to share our knowledge and to share our models because we have a lot of models that we've developed over the years. And we said, if we want to help entrepreneurs, we have to share information. And so we made our models available on our website and we started organizing these webinars. We had one in July or, uh, hosted by Edis, one of the speakers of today, um, on strategic planning. We had a second one on customer experience by our colleagues Bob and Valerie. Next up was sales development with the, the sales guys or the sales experts Erwin and Bart, who shared the batteries of sales model. Then you had Bram in November on how to boost your export. And Lucia closed the, the session of last year on employee engagement in December. At the start of this year, I was one of the speakers together with co my colleague Serge on marketing. And today we have a topic on how to grow with zero marketing budget. Now, how did we get to this particular topic? That's an interesting question. One of the inspirations uh, for that was a, a, a report published by Gardner stating that CMOs would spend in 2020 and 2021 their budgets differently because they expect budget cuts and they would be very conservative in a way. They would go for low risk for a status quo, maintaining of the business. And the question we were asking was, how can you still grow? How can you as an entrepreneur, as a manager, still make sure you can grow without any additional budget? And this is exactly what my two colleagues and let's say our senior uh, consultants and senior speakers uh, uh, will share with you today. So I gladly give the floor to Edith Ticket and Lucia Sutens. Enjoy the session. Thank you. 12 o'clock lunchtime. Well, I would like to welcome you all and we're gonna discuss about growing with a zero budget. Is that possible? I don't believe so, but I will explain you what is possible. Now, we believe that the question is uh, particularly interesting because we saw that there were close to 1,800 participants for the three webinars today. And I will end already, or I will start already with the conclusions of today. Well, first of all, before the conclusions, let me say something. If you expect information about influencer marketing or social media or other growth hacking techniques, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about the real fundamentals for growth about going to the emotions behind your company and your products or services. Now, three things that you should remember after this session. First of all, one, 
You should have a clear passport. You should have a clear identity for your company. Build that, and that's based on emotions. We explain that one. Second one, if you have it, use it in a consistent and coherent way. And not only on the external side, but also internally. Change behaviors even when needed. And the third element is be distinctive. And there, we will teach you today, or we explain today, how to do ghost riding. So that's for the end of the session. Not yet ghost riding at the beginning. Okay. Let's, step, let's take a step back and look at this picture. It's an example. What do we see? I see here guys who are very, very glad. They are enthusiastic. They even they just scream it out. Yes, I have an iPhone. I have an iPhone. And this could have been other uh, things too. It could have been PlayStation. It could have been Nike shoes. But what you see here is people who are touched in the heart. They are emotional about the purchase. Now, you must imagine, probably these guys, they slept in front of the door of the shop before buying it. So the first thing you would expect when buying this is that they want to unpack it and use it. No, maybe these people do not even need a phone. They have a phone, but they are touched in the heart by a product and they want it. And they're so glad that they say, I have it. Maybe you should have it too. And that's one of the first fundamentals about growing with zero budget. It's about touching the people, creating ambassadors, but especially touching people in the heart, having emotions. And the strange thing is, these companies, a lot of these companies have strong brands. They do not even have to advertise. The people do it for you. So instead of you, they are doing the advertising. Now, let me do a little exercise with you. When I'm teaching at university, I have a kind of an exercise. I would like to do it in this webinar too. I can give you, you can have two things from me. On the one hand, you can have a two euro coin, which I can give to you, or you can choose a lottery ticket where you can win a multitude, 20, 200, 2000, up to 20 million euro, and you become a multi-millionaire. Now, on the right side of, uh, of the webinar, you'll see that there is a poll. I would ask you to choose. What do you choose? Do you want the two euro coin? Or do you want this fabulous 20 million lottery ticket? Lucia, do we have any voting? Yes, the votings are coming in. Whoa, this is spectacular. Well, what we see is that approximately 70% of the people choose for the lottery ticket. This morning, it was even 88%. So. That's an important one to notice. We see that a lottery ticket is more appealing than a coin of two euros. And they have the same value in the end. Even a two euro coin is more valuable if physically than the lottery ticket. The lottery ticket you can buy here in Belgium for 1.25. Now, why is it? That's because of the emotional value of a lottery ticket. And if you would have time, I would do this exercise with you. I would ask you to map the emotions. And we see here a mapping of very negative, neutral, up to positive emotions with a score layer from one to four. And if you would add up the emotions that a lottery ticket brings versus the just a coin, then you'll see that the emotional value of a lottery ticket is 20 times higher than the one of the coin. And that's what's important. And that's also important in your company. Emotions are important. Even big companies make mistakes. I can give you an example of Google Glass. Google Glass was created and it's a great technical product, but what they lacked was emotions. My apologies for the people who bought it. There are a couple of people who bought it, but I would say, if you bought it, you're more like a glass hole than something uh, different. You don't want to be there. And what's the reason? It's because it's developed by engineers. Engineers who say like, hey, I want to create a perfect product. I'm going to sell a perfect product. You should act like an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs, they create amazing products that people want to buy. And if people want to buy it, that makes a difference. It's because they are touched in their heart. And being touched in the heart, there is always, there's also a scientific reason why this works. Lucia, can you explain something about uh, the scientific reasoning behind it? 
Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, well, in fact, it, it is maybe um, a bit funny because we talk about being touched in the heart, but in the end, it's all about our brains. Um, we could say that our brains consist of three major parts. The first part in yellow on uh, your screen is what we call the neocortex. It's your rational brain. It's the brain that helps you make decisions based on facts and figures, on analysis, on statistics. It's also the part of your brain that understands language. The second part of your brain is the limbic brain. That is, in fact, the part of the brain that takes decisions on an emotional level. It uh, starts with preferences. Um, to what extent do I feel good with this decision? And then the third part of your brain is your reptilian brain. And that is, in fact, the brain that gives you reflexes when you're in danger. It goes very quickly. Now, science says that approximately 96% of our decisions are taken by the limbic brain. That means that 96% of our decisions are taken based on emotional value because we feel good, because it gives us trust. So that means that to have a preference as a brand, to be preferred, you need to touch emotions. And we say you need to touch the heart, but in the end, it's in the brain that it happens. Now, maybe you will say, yeah, touching the heart, that is for something for brands in B2C. That's not valid for B2B. Oh, yes, it is. And also here, there is scientific evidence. Gartner has published a study where they, where they say that the emotional value weighs twice over the rational value. So the way that the B2B prospect or customer is feeling about your proposal is much more important, double, than the facts and the figures. So if this client or prospect asks you for more figures, for more statistics, for more proof, that means that in the end, he doesn't feel like it is right. So also a B2B client is a person, of course, even in his professional role. So also with this person, you need to build a relationship. You need to build connection in order to be able to touch his or her heart. Now, how do you do that? Well, you need to build a brand. And before explaining how you build a brand, let me say this. You only have one brand because there is sometimes some confusion about it that we hear, yeah, but there's an employer brand and a customer brand. No, there's only one brand within your company. And it is possible that you have different executions, for example, in a commercial sense, towards your customers. Then we talk about product marketing, product branding, service branding, etc. Different names are used. And of course, we also talk about employer branding. When you position yourself as an employer, maybe you use different channels to communicate and maybe the content of your message is slightly different. But it starts again from the same core one brand. There's even a third possibility that is the corporate branding. When you talk to key opinion leaders or stakeholders, then also there you might use different channels and a slightly different content. So there's only one brand. And what do you need to build for that brand? Well, in fact, you need to build a passport. And a passport that is something that we all have. It describes our identity. It says who we are, where we born, and also where we have been, because the stamps in your passport, that shows the story of your life, your experiences. Well, the same you can do for your, for your brand or brands. You can build a passport. And based on our experiences that we have in different companies, we built the business markers passport. It has 10 sections. You can see that you will have to fill in the roots the market you play in, the products and services that you're offering, and many more. In fact, the core of this brand passport is about your purpose, your promise, and your values. And let me dig a little bit deeper into that one. Because purpose, promise, and values, that in fact is the answer to three major questions. The first question is the why question. Why do you do what you do? Why do you exist? What is your mission? What is the dream that you want to accomplish? Second question is what? What do you have to offer? What is your promise or your value proposition 
towards your customers. And the third question is how? How will you communicate? What is the color you're giving to your company or your brand? How will you differentiate? What will make you unique? Because in fact, what competition does, that might be the same, but the way that you're doing might be different. So it's in fact the values that will differentiate you. Oh, values. Yeah, Lucia, they say to me then, but values we have, look, they're here uh, on the wall, you can read them. And then I go and read and I see, okay, it's about respect, innovative, um, authenticity and customer friendliness. Yeah, right. That's values, but they're very generic. I even call them container concepts. That's why you see this visual on the slide. They do not really sharply describe what you are about. Let me take innovative, for example. That's very generic. Do you want to be trend breaking maybe or revolu revolutionary? That will be much more specific. And that gives you a more sharp identity. Let me give you this exercise. I have here two car brands and they have a quite different set of values. The first one says to be safe, social and dutiful. The second one says to be ambitious, competitive and results oriented. I give you a couple of seconds to think about it, what brands it could be. I'm sure it's not so difficult and that you easily find out that it's about Volvo and BMW. How comes? How comes that this is so easy? Well, in fact, that is because those brands, they go back to archetypes. And archetypes, that is something that Carl Jung kind of invented for us in the previous century. He developed personality characteristics, which made him easier to diagnose his patients and to help them further. Well, those personality characteristics, they are used to develop different models. And we also use one of them. What you see here is a model with axis. You have the vertical axis that gives you on the upper uh, part of the graph, it gives you all archetypes that are more outward looking. They're up to change into the outer world. The one below are archetypes that are more on into control, more introverted. On the left, you see those who are task and result oriented. They want to position themselves in relation to the rest. And on the other side, you have the group there. You find archetypes that find that interaction and relation, the group is much more important. So in the end, it gives you eight archetypes and they all have a name. You can see there's the adventurer, the leader, the organizer, etc. And all of them have a very specific mission. The leader, for example, he wants to be the best, while the caretaker wants to be supportive. Now we can go back to the cars and we can plot the different brands of the cars on the archetypes. Where do you think BMW and Volvo would be positioned? Now let me reveal, it's not so difficult. BMW is a leader, while Volvo is a guardian. And you can finish this graph by plotting also other car brands like this, for example. But Edith, I think you had a quite interesting anecdote about the car brands, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, cars, they all do the same. They bring us from A to B, and they have four wheels. But in the end, we take a decision. And it's strange to say, but most of the car decisions are taken based on emotions. And that's why some brands are not even mentioned on these uh, archetypes. Why is Ford not on this graph? Well, Ford, they win prizes for having the best engine, the best product, but they lack emotions. And if you don't have emotions, people will, will, will have difficulties to choose for you. So if you're in a gray zone, have no emotions, you're not gonna sell that well. So you need strong emotions. If you look at BMW and Volvo, well, both brands are there. Now, Volvo is a safe car. We know all that. Now, even if you look at car crash tests, you see that the scores of BMW and Volvo are not different. In some car crash tests, BMW scores even better. But that does not mean they're going to start communicating about it, because that's not where the character and their identity, where they stand for. But it goes even further. When you have these brands and you drive this car, 
you're going to take these emotions into yourself and act upon them. If a Volvo uh, driver, is, if your person is going to drive a Volvo car, he's going to have less accidents than if he would, the same person would drive a BMW. That's because in a Volvo, he, he thinks more securely, more safety, safely. Once he moves into a BMW, he's going to drive more assertive. The non-BMW drivers call it more aggressive. So emotions go that far that it helps, it decides you which brand to choose. So you have, need to have an emotion to drive your sales and your purchase, to have your growth. But even your consumers will act upon it and reinforce it. Now, these archetypes, it might be difficult uh, to, to understand the limbic brain, the emotions behind it. But if you look at it in society, you see it everywhere. Even when Hunger Games are uh, developed, they have like characters on, uh, on every aspect of it. So everybody can connect to one of the characters in the Hunger Game. If you play games with your family, somebody will choose Stratego, Stratego because it's more result-oriented. Or a family game uh, like uh, Twister or a specialist game like Mastermind. And the same holds for sports. Now in business, it's the same as well for B2C brands as B2B brands. An example here is like in IT. Now I'm showing big companies, that's easier, but it also holds for smaller companies. If I look, Apple, for instance, is in the red quadrant. They are more creative, innovative. They challenge the status quo. While Intel at the other side, they say it themselves, you have the sticker on your PC, it's about Intel inside. They're more introvert. So the positioning of a company and the emotions can be based on archetypes. Archetypes help to develop your purpose, your promise, and your values which are a crucial part of your passport. As Lucia explained, if you don't have a passport, well, or even if your employees don't know the passport, you're like a homeless, you're a vagrant. You should have one to be recognized by the others. This passport you need to build. I need to integrate your experience, your emotions into it. Let us give an example of a company. Yes, thank you. Let's talk about Tobania. Tobania is a fast growing company. And uh, in order to further um, sustain their growth, they wanted to sharpen their brand. So the first thing you need to do is to make an analysis of the as uh, situation. And that you do by uh, taking interviews, having an online survey. And out of these um, surveys, out of this uh, analysis came that the ideal archetype for Tobania is the lively leader. Now you hear that the archetype is based of two elements. It is a, at the base, it is a leader, but it is a lively leader, which means that you take some positive, some characteristics out of one of your neighbors, the, the life-hearted one. With that uh, archetype in mind, we started to build the purpose. And uh, for the purpose, we have two thoughts. On, uh, on one hand, um, Tobania works with companies that are in a continuous digital transformation. They need to change so quickly and so fast that to, they constantly reinvent themselves. Now, on the second hand, Tobania also wants to be there for their employees. Um, they want them to be able to continuously grow, to continuously evolve and learn. So why does Tobania then exist? Well, because they are the incubator of your future, both for customers as for their own employees. Secondly, for the promise, well, um, the promise is your wingman making digital work because Tobania wants to be a partner for their customers, a partner based on trust, but result oriented. And their wingman was the ideal word to work with. The values were easily decided. It is together, open, bright and entrepreneurial. And as you can see, they have formed the base for a new briefing of visual identity, which is with these uh, yellow and pinky colors. The four values also form the letter word Toby, and they did a little bit uh, play around with the words. It, is, uh, it has become a campaign which is to be or not to be with then the head of Shakespeare. Here you can see 
one of the um, visuals that they made around open communication. Open communication is the way we roll at Stobania internally, but also externally. For example, the CEO, the CFO, they both regularly post on social media, talk about what they do and how they uh, work together with their customers. Good, so we touched upon the first element of our webinar, the brand passport. Now we would like to know what the situation is within your companies. To what extent do you already have a passport? And it would be good that you go to the poll and have a look and vote there for what your situation is. You have three options. First option is we figured it out and we, have, we use it all the way. Second option, somewhere in between, we have some elements, but not at all as clear and as sharp or as bold as we would like to. And the third element is, yeah, well, we need to start with it. We need to work on it. There's still a lot of work to do. So submit your vote and then let's have a look at how um, the results are. Edith. Yes, the results are coming in. Uh, we figured it out has a score of, uh, well, 20 at max now. So 80% uh, says uh, we have something where half is have something and half has nothing. So it seems that uh, there are some interesting elements uh, uh, to work on. Um, so we end with 16% having it all figured out and 84% still have to work on it or have nothing. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Let's uh, look how we can do it. And we end with the first part. That's to have a clear and sharp passport. Build on your purpose, your promise and your values. But even more, it has also your roots in it, your uh, target group products and services. And importantly, your consumers should know about it or your, customer, your employees should know about it. And that's the second element where I would like to talk about. If you have it, you have to use it in a consistent and coherent way. Even if you have to change behaviors of people, and that's the most difficult one. That's where you can grow without budget by having a real impact. But let me, let me explain a couple of examples why I'm saying this. Well, first of all, we have this subconscious element that is taking decisions. That's our, our limbic system. And that subconscious system, that means safety. Safety, if they are surprised too much, then, then they, 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 will re re they will reject it. So you get a negative emotion and that's not good. So you need to be consistent in the way you communicate in everything you do. I'll give you an example. There is a store in my village and I've taken a picture and it looks like this. Now, if I ask you what you see, what, what it brings to you, um, I don't know what you would say. I, I, can I hear you? No. If I, if I have this in a class or in a workshop, then people say, oh, it, it looks very natural. It looks fresh. Uh, probably it's bio products uh, coming from the farmer. It looks uh, clean. Um, some people will say, oh, it looks maybe expensive. And that's true. The store is 20% more expensive than, than the regular grocery store. That's true. But in the end, we don't see any communication or advertising. And still, by showing this, people have a clear emotional feeling of what the shop will bring. And it gives eagerness to come and buy there. That's good. Now, one day I was uh, walking around, I was calling, and I was walking in the alley next to the shop. And when I walked there, I was a bit surprised because I saw things like this, the garbage. And I, I walked on and I saw that it became even worse. There was the fruit and vegetable close to the garbage. And I was mostly surprised when even seeing some, some sanitary um, elements being next to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the fruit, which made me a bit like, uh, oh, this is not what I expected. So I went inside and I talked to the owner and I explained like, hey, your front and your backside are pretty different. Um, why, why is it? And the guy, he got really furious. He explained to me, you should not have been there. Uh, that's private property. And uh, well, he solved it too. That's good news. So next week I came back. What he did is, well, like, he put a fence, but I could not enter the backside anymore. I must say, this is not the solution I recommend to you. The solution I recommend to you 
is to do something about it. To win outside, you have to start at the inside. And it's not by building a wall. Today with social media, your inside is as visual as your outside. So you have to work and train your employees on how to send out the right message. If I would use this same example and then look into a restaurant, then it's the same thing. Even if you have the best products and then the, the cook is making the best products, but your waiter is serving it not fast enough, it's getting cold, or he's not bringing drinks fast enough, only the bill is coming fast enough at the end, you probably will not come back to the shop anymore, to the restaurant anymore. So growing is possible, but you have to act consistent and coherent all the way from the product, the physical item, to the full experience and emotions. Your employees are a crucial element in it. Somebody wanted to buy a car and he wanted to buy a Jeep and he already felt it. So he went to the store and he wanted this emotion. I went to the store and he saw like this, this, this building, it was like big glass and, and they went inside, it was like a marble floor, very clean. And then he went to the representative who wants to, to, to buy, to want to sell a Jeep and he saw this guy. Well, I, I couldn't ask to have a picture of this guy, but he, he looks like this guy. It's a very clean guy in a suit. And the guy, he finally said like, hey, I don't want to buy a car. I want to buy, I don't want to buy a Jeep anymore. The feelings he had, the emotions, why he wanted a Jeep were not reflected all the way into the, per, into the, the, the purchase funnel. If this would have been the store, probably he would have bought it. So we have to be consistent and coherent all the way. Your passport is the base to start with, but then you have to translate it to all elements on the big wheel. You have to, to make sure that your process and systems are all right, your communication, the designs, your products, but especially the biggest part of the wheel is behavior of your people. And it's not only about the front office people, it's also the back office people. The invoices you send, the per people who are taking care of customer care, about rep reparations, etc. People who bike will know that if the big wheel in the front turns, that the other wheel will turn even faster. And that's what you should do. Your internal organization should be based on your passport, on your brand. You should fix the elements, make them consistent, coherent, and this will translate in building, growing faster. This is also proven in a study by Gromarka Melin. And they've put the elements on two axes. On the lower axis, on the horizontal axis, you see you have companies that uh, use the brand, the passport, for sales and marketing purposes. On the horizontal axis, vertical axis, you see companies who have used their brand to build an organizational culture. Well, you have companies who use it for both. And when they were comparing operating margins, you see that companies started with 8%. The companies only used like a brand and a logo, but the ones who have the passport and used it for really branding, marketing sales, went up from 8 to 9.6. The ones who use it for organizational culture grew to 12%, but the ones who have used the passport for all what they've did internally and externally, they had nearly double as high of profit as the other ones. And that's where it all is about. That's about growing with a limited budget, making sure that you use the emotions, build a passport, translate it into behavior and all the elements in a flywheel. So the second learning of today, be consistent and coherent when building your passport. Is that enough, Lucia? Or can you give an example? Well, what is important, I think, to further explain is how you do that. How do you make sure that all of your employees behave in a consistent and a coherent way. What, once you have your passport, how do you then make it happen? Well, I can assure you that it will not be via a t-shirt. What you can see here is people wearing a t-shirt and it says in Dutch, yes, we can, we go for it, something like that. That is not going to make the difference. That is not going to drive their behavior. What do you need to do then? Well, there are different steps. Let me start by the first step, which we explained, that is building your passport. 
imagine that you have done that, then the first thing, let's say that your passport is something new. So then the first thing is you're going to announce it. You're going to communicate around it. And I would like to recommend you to communicate it in a very lively way so that people immediately experience and feel what your passport is about. Here you can see an example of Technopolis. Technopolis completely changed their purpose, their promise and their values. So they wanted to announce this change to their people. And we created an event in which there were different workshops, four workshops, so that people could immediately feel and experience what those new values were about. It's about being creative, entrepreneurial, being clear and being energetic. Now you might say, this doesn't look zero budget, Lucia, this looks quite expensive. Yes, that's true. But in this case, I would like to stress that I'm sure that you have budgets for team building, for bringing people together. So whenever you have those budgets and you spend them, then please spend them in a way that they're coherent with your brand passport and that it brings your values alive, that people feel and experience it. Now, communicating is more than just announcing. Once you announce, it's important to explain. What do you mean with all those words in the passport? Does everybody understand? And then you need to repeat. Repeat, 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 because you never communicate enough. That is something that we hear regularly. We don't have enough communication. So even if you think that you're already done enough, you're still halfway. Repetition is important. Then there's the second step that is about concretize. What do you mean? What do we mean by that? Well, in fact, the words that you can see and understand in the passport, they also mean something specific for me in my job. Imagine that I'm a receptionist and I have to be creative because creative is one of our values. What does that mean for me? I understand the word, but how does that change or influence my job? The same for the salesperson who needs to be creative. Or imagine the, the, the one working on accounting. Does he need them to do creative accounting? Maybe that's worth talking about. How do you do that? Very simply, you talk about it with your people. You set up a workshop with a team of the same function, the same jobs, and you're going to exchange on how they see that their jobs might evolve. How might they need to do things differently? Let people come up with their own examples and their own proposals and then decide on their own action plans. A personal action plan, maybe some actions for the team and even for the complete organization. Now, concretizing is also about leadership. And very important, your leaders need to be an example. They have this role that people will copy. So if they behave in line with the, with the values, your people will also do so. That may, is also part of concretizing. Other ideas are working with a values team that can set up certain projects or with an ambassador program. The third element then is about anchoring. Because in Concretize, you might have um, made a big action list of things to do. But that doesn't mean that these changes are immediately um, embedded as new habits. We're all very linked to our old habits and we like to keep it. That is our human nature. So if you want to change something in behavior, you need to support your people. You need to help them, remind them about it. You can do that in very different ways. One example is this valuable box that uh, Standard Buchhandel and Club developed. Well, within that box, every month there was a new, let's say, task or work idea where the team leader of a shop could, within his or her team meeting, talk about with his or her people. And that way, he or she could bring the passport alive and make it concrete on the floor in the shop. A second element that is very important for your anchorage is about your policies. You should embed all changes in policies. Think about HR policies, for example. To what extent influences this new or evolved passport our recruiting philosophy? What are we going to change when we approach candidates? What do we maybe change in our onboarding system? Is there new material that we need to develop or new ways of communicating? And then very important also, to what extent does it influence our evaluation system? 
Will we use the values to evaluate people? I would say yes, but then please take it into account, take it on board in your system. So in that way, again, you will make sure that you anchor your new passport. Other examples of policies that makes it very visible uh, are the car policy. You have here the minis of Deloitte. They make a certain behavior and feeling very visible, both for the employee who drives with it, as for, let's say, the public or the customers who see the minis in the street. Also, a dress code is very visible. So a change in dress code can mean, let's say, a change in behavior, a change in branding, a fact of a new beginning. Why not? So the three elements, communicate, concretize, and anchoring, are in fact in a 360-degree circle. And it's an ongoing process that never stops. And it goes even in the two directions. So it's an interchangeable model that you need to continue to work on. Now, one company that does this very well is Cool Blue. The CEO and one of the founders of Cool Blue is Peter Zwart, and he communicates very openly about it. They also um, put on their website their five values. It is about being unconventional or quirky. It's about go for it, the can-do mentality. It's about being friends because they're a club of friends. And it's about being flexible and last but not least, simply amaze. amaze. They do everything for the smile on your face. Now, those five values, they influence their internal policies, as I just gave the example. For example, in recruiting, they would ask something like, well, um, to what extent do you like your private and professional life be separate? Now, if someone there answers, oh, yes, I like it to be separate, I want private and professional completely um, different, then probably that candidate will not be uh, offered a contract because at Cool Blue, they want everyone to be friends and to be the separation much more blurry than some people would like to. It's, it's, it's better to know that up front from both parties. So that's how they integrate it in uh, to HR, one of the HR policies. They also make it very visible internally. For example, the way they um, decorate and organize meeting rooms is very famous. You have a cafe, you have a sing sephore, and I really like this one. It's the Ballenbach. It is very unconventional, quirky even, and it puts a smile on your face. There's also their Christmas party. Well, you know, in December, it's quite busy at Cool Blue because we're all buying Christmas gifts. So they don't have time to organize Christmas parties in December. But you know, we're Cool Blue, so we're unconventional. Let's organize Christmas party in October. So in the middle of autumn, you hear Wham and Mariah Carey, you see people um, in, with, with, with Christmas hats and they celebrate Chris, Christmas because, hey, we're friends, we're unconventional and we do it our way. So a nice example also. Now that's internal examples. I also have an external example towards uh, their uh, customers. This is um, a picture of the blue box that they're sending. Now, on this blue box, there's on every of the six sides, there's little jokes that put a smile on your face. And even beyond just the smile, people are posting on social media about it. So people become ambassadors because you connected with them, because you touched their hearts. And that is in the end what we all want. We want those ambassadors that freely make publicity for us. So it all comes down to this customer journey which we all know. You start by the beginning with awareness, consideration, etc. And in every step of the funnel, it's very important that you link with your customers that, or potential customers, that you build a relationship with them and even enhance and strengthen that relationship. So that in the end, after becoming customers and loyal customers, they become brand ambassadors and make publicity for you. The same is valid for the employee journey. It's the same way of thinking. People are aware of you as being an employer. They might consider to apply. Then they apply, they come into a selection process. They become slightly connected to you. Then they sign a contract, start to perform, become employees. And then what we want is them to be engaged employees. 
and engagement of your employees, that is something very crucial. Um, for sure now in these COVID times, it's a very hot topic. If you would like to know more about it, I um, would like to invite you to ask for the replay of the webinar that we've um, created specifically around employee engagement. You can request the replay via our website. Now, in the end, what you also want from your um, employees is that also they become brand ambassadors. So employer brand, corporate brand, customer brand, the end goal is to have ambassadors who are to that extent emotionally linked to your brand and your company that they spontaneously start to make publicity around you. Now you could leverage that with tools and we know that there are a lot of tools. The slide is full here of logos of brands that offer you tools and we could help you to select the right ones, but do not forget that before you start to use a tool, you first need to have this emotional connection. A tool won't help you if this emotional link, this relationship is not strong enough. Okay, let us uh, set up a new poll again and um, look at to what extent you all are working with the passport, bringing it to life into all your touch points, both internally and externally to, in the end, create brand ambassadors. So when you go to the poll, you will see that you have four options. The first one is, yeah, we still have no clear passport. So sorry, you cannot even start by, uh, by start with applying it. Second option is, um, well, we have a passport, but it's not really something alive. It's more like a poster on the wall. Third option is our passport doesn't really influence our behavior and action. And then the, for, the fourth one is, well, action and behavior, it's all in sync with our passport. And that's, of course, the best option. Edith, do you already see some results coming? Yeah, in? yeah, yeah. people are uh, very interactive. Um, congratulations again. There are about uh, 20 to 25 percent of the respondents who have their behaviors and actions in sync with the passport. Wow, that's great. This means on the other side, there are 75% who still has to work on it, where one on the three, 34%, still has no passport. So, something to still work on. a lot on. of work to do, yeah. Good. Let's go to the third part. The third part. Now we know we start with you need emotions drive decisions you need identity in your company to reflect these emotions in who you are and that's different than what you sell we translated this into internal and external elements to make a difference and that difference well we said already it should be consistent and coherent but it should also be distinctive let me teach you to ghost write you know what a lot of companies do is well we're gonna we, we put our car in a traffic jam. We look what the competition is doing, and we're copying it, and we're doing the same. And it's the same as putting your car just behind another car. Now look at the other side of the highway. There are a lot of lanes which are completely free. There are, there are empty, you can drive on them. So why not go straight and gonna drive on that side? I can't even tell you more. In Belgium, there are not even 10 dead people a year of ghost riding. So it's not that dangerous. Even more, if you do it, you're gonna be announced on the radio. What do you want more? Now, I do not wanna say that in public transport or in transport on the highway, you should do it, but as a company, you should do it. Too much we are thinking on copying our competition and doing just all the same. You know that one year of our life, we are sitting in our car, just looking at the back of the car in front of us. Drive on the other lane, be distinctive, do something which is different than the others, be unique. Though, don't forget, it should be consistent and coherent with your archetype, with your passport. And let me give you a couple of examples. And one of them is IKEA. IKEA, well, I could have found 100 examples. Even from IKEA, I could have found 50, but let me explain you a couple of them. First of all, the purpose of IKEA is that everybody can design his or her own life. And they do it by the promise that you can buy affordable design. And they have a list of 10 values at IKEA. And of these 10 values, I've selected 
three of them, daring to be different, constant desire of renewal and cost consciousness. And this is an example of what they did in Australia, New Zealand. Well, they asked, they saw that they had people who were moving to another house. They were living together, so they needed new furniture. And what they did is they asked people, well, you can come and marry in an IKEA store. And not, not less than 500 people subscribed to do it, to have their marriage party in an IKEA. Finally, it happened and they did it as a couple. I should not explain to you that the cost is pretty low, the exposure we have is pretty high, and you are building a message based on your value, cost consciousness, and it's building your business. Now, another one was they saw that mums, when they're having a baby, they're not going to IKEA for the first kid store. So they wanted to be something to, to, to do ghost riding and to attract these young parents. And what they did is not just having an advertising on baby furniture. No, they did a pregnancy test in their magazine. So people could really do the pregnancy test. Now, it's not about the pregnancy test. I don't think that people did it. Maybe, maybe they tried it. I don't know. But in the end, the result was by ghost riding that they increased their sales of baby furniture with 50%. That's being different. Now, do you know the store Little? They went to a repositioning and one of their values was be more innovative. But how do you bring young people into this store and have this innovative message? Well, they launched last summer this sportswear uh, limited edition line and which was like, it was a hype amongst uh, the people. They had like a little fanware and these fanware this could be bought in the store, but after it was even, <laughs> you could buy it even more on the internet for higher prices. They might consider to launch this, 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 well, this nice fanware and on a permanent base in their store. This is ghost riding based on their values, thinking in a different way. Now, what did we learn today? If you want to grow as a company with a limited budget or with zero budget, we first have to understand the emotions. Who are we? Don't only tell what you are, but who you are and how you're going to do it. Secondly, translate it both internally and externally. Remember the wheel we have. The big wheel should turn to make the small wheel turn even faster. That's inside and outside. You, start, you should start inside to win outside. And last, there is the ghost riding. If you build something, look for something which is special, which is unique. Go ghost riding. If you want some help to think about it, you can always call us and uh, maybe we can help you, you, your team or your organization. And it's pretty easy. If you SMS to 0498 52 33 11 and you message your word passport, I can assure you, you'll get a call back. Now, this was the webinar of today and I would like to thank you for listening. I hope you learned some, something. And I also would like you to invite for our next webinar, the eighth webinar, which is going to be hosted by Fritjof. Fritjof is going to talk about how to grow and expand in new territories in a cheap or economical way. And he's going to explain to you the discovery-driven phased approach. So if you click, you can subscribe for the next webinar, and we are more than happy to explain this. Now, I still have a Q&A. We still have some time left to answer a couple of questions. For those who want to go, I would say thank you very much. Thank you for being here. You've been uh, uh, hosted by AB a Sound here. So if you uh, are interested in these kinds of webinar, you can always contact them. Now, maybe Lucia, let's have a look for those who still have five minutes, whether we can answer a couple of questions. Yes, so please send in your questions via the tab questions on the live storm. Um, for the moment, what is coming in is uh, people saying thank you, no questions, thanks for the interesting webinar, our pleasure. There um, have been two questions during the webinar that are in the meantime already answered, so uh, also there for the moment, okay. no questions. Congrats, read, very interesting, someone says. I read one uh, during the break about small companies versus big companies. Somebody was asking, yeah, this is only for big companies. This is not true. 
as soon as your company has about 25 people, this story becomes crucial. Because in the beginning, you start a company and you, can, you are the company, you can explain and show everything to everybody. Now, once your company is growing, as founder, you cannot be anywhere every time. And everything communicates. So that's the point where you surely have to think about your passport, because then it's going to be a, a way to explain it to your managers, your middle management, to all people who you are and what you want as type of behavior. Yeah, indeed. Um, there's some practical question coming in. Someone asking, how can I get some material about the brand passport? Uh, someone who wants to keep working on it and share it with her team. Well, you can download the passport on our website. Uh, you can also ask for a free replay on our website. So if you're interested in either one of both, please feel free. And of course, you can further contact us if you would like to have more assistance on it. Okay. Um, is it advisable, that's a new question, is it advisable to change your identity? Let's say you decide to take a turn in five years' time. Yeah, well, that de depends on the situation, of course. That's, uh, yeah. It is possible, but as mentioned, it's advisable. it takes time. It takes time, yes. Well, first of all, you cannot change everything. There are in your values probably two anchor values, which are in your DNA, and you probably won't change but you can have aspirational values and unique values, which make a movement. And it's gonna take some time. If you go in the archetypes to the other side, probably you have to choose a circle, how you're gonna move there. It's not easy, but it is possible, both in the private sector as well in the public sector. Yeah, indeed. Um, another question, and it's a bit linked to the, what you said before, is someone asking, how can I start a password for a small enterprise? How do I know what would be suitable as the organization is still small and finding its way? Well, even when an organization is small, you should think about why you exist and what are you offering and how are you offering it? It, it doesn't have to do anything with size. Of course, the size becomes um, more relevant. No, it becomes more relevant when the size is bigger uh, because as Ida said, you need to communicate around it and it's not all in one hand anymore. So it's absolutely feasible and it's just a matter of reflecting about it, writing, maybe some brainstorm and you end up with the answer to these uh, very important questions. Same as your roots, your products, your market, target group, etc. The difficulty is not linked with the size of your company, on the contrary. Okay. Any more? Uh, in hosting. I don't get this one. Do you get more signups from those words or from paid promotion? The question is do you get more signups from your passport or from paid promotions? Ha. Signups meaning? Um, probably customers, do you get more business uh, from business, having a passport yes, okay. or from paid promotions? Well, paid promotions, we know them. It started with the soap advertising uh, uh, by Procter & Gamble years ago. Paid promotions are one thing, but we see that this is not always connecting to the consumer anymore. Uh, of course, there are still paid promotions, but the more you can go to people being becoming ambassadors and explain and tell others about the good things of your company is going to be easier. And the same for employees. Is it more or less? It's going to depend on your companies. It's going to be a balance. But anyway, even if you have paid promotions and no passport, you have an issue. You have an issue, yes, indeed. Okay, we still have time for a last one. Um, there's someone asking, uh, we are a group of companies working as one team. Should we have one common passport or different for each company? Yeah. That's a very valid question. I guess if you say uh, different for each company, that there are different names and thus different brands, but they're, that you're all part of one group. We don't know you and your, your company or companies, but um, what we see sometimes is that, let's say, daughter companies or daughter brands could have a separate passport, but as they're part of one group, they also have one red line, one team in common, which is your, let's call it corporate passport, which is the thing that um, links you all together. You can see different examples. Um, in Belgium, there's uh, the Colred Group who has different sub-brands. Each, each sub-brand has his own identity, but the Colred Group also has his identity and brings it all together. So it's not separated and all different. It, it, there is a link amongst all of them. 
I hope that is an answer to your question. That's a it's a complicated one and it depends really yeah, it depends on your on company. Yeah. Uh, Fnac van der Borde, two companies also have a red line. Then you have like the Colgate Group. But uh, if you if you would like, uh, contact us and uh, and glad to to explain some more uh, via video call. Yes, indeed. And then I see it's one o'clock, so we promised to finish in one hour. If there are additional questions, please feel free to send them. We will for sure answer all of them and contact you in direct. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed it. Yes. <laughs> and I would like to say thank you very much. See you next time. And thank you also for to AB Sound for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.